Hi, everybody. Welcome to Lean Whiskey. It's episode 29. I'm Mark Graben, and we are joined by Jamie Flinchball. Glad to see you again. Jamie, good to see you again. For those who are listening and not watching, like Jamie's got this big martini glass um, filling up half the frame and the video. <laughs> if you go over to YouTube, you can see what he's drinking, and we'll we'll get to that in a minute, right? That's right. You'll uh and it won't fill the screen for very long. So uh, I'll take care of that. It, it's it's like forced perspective. It looks like it's a huge 16 ounce cocktail, which is probably not the case. It's not the case. It's a standard martini <laughs> glass. So, uh, okay. um, but yes, just where the camera is, it, it looks quite big. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so we're going to, before we get into different topics today, we're going to catch up just a little bit here. We didn't record last month, you know, it's summertime. What, what have you been up to here over the summer, Jamie? Well, uh, all sorts of things, but uh, especially with, you know, daughter home from college, et cetera. But, but uh, probably the biggest new thing, um, I retired from coaching soccer in, in early June and um, decided to get my ref, referee's license um, hmm. for, for soccer. And I actually start, start uh, refing some games uh, this week, um, a couple of days from now. So. Um, it's, it, you know, it's, it, we'll see. It's an experiment. I don't know if I'll enjoy it. I think I will. Mm -hmm. um, they're all, they're all questions around people's manners and how much that bugs me or doesn't bug me. Um, but there's a shortage um, of, of referees, uh, mostly because of uh, parent and coach behaviors. Mm. Um, but, you know, to me, it's, it's, you're still part of the sport. You can, you can leave it behind when you leave the field. And uh, you, you technically get paid exercise, which is <laughs> um, if you do it right, at least. Uh, so, uh, so it's my my experiment, just uh, just underway. So, when's your first game going to be? First match? Uh, first match is Tuesday, so two days okay. from our recording today. So, actually, yeah. uh, before uh, it will have already happened by the time the recording is released. So, uh, so we'll see. Um, see how we like it. <laughs> well follow up on that next time like do you get a standard issue yellow card and red card and and no. how quickly are you are are you going to use any of those i wonder well so it's not standard issue you got to buy your own stuff so i have <laughs> yeah. you know flags and cards and coins and and uh whistles and 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 you know three uniform shirts cuz you got to have different colors um but but honestly i believe uh that that especially the younger ages um People hold back from giving yellow cards too too much, and and kids don't learn how to receive the, the feedback of what's called a <laughs> caution. It's all it is. Mm -hmm. It's a caution. Mm -hmm. There's like literally no real consequence to it unless you get a second one, unless you don't yeah. change your behavior. So, um, to me, it's a great lesson. I I I I will probably be not prolific, but I'll probably <laughs> definitely be on on one end of the bell curve of giving out at least yellow cards I, I certainly don't once you have to give out a red it's it's gone, gone too far but uh but hoping the you know use the yellow cards uh, smartly so but if they complain if they don't take the feedback of the yellow card well does the second card yellow card that that means red card and uh that means that means yep that means red card so uh you know it's it's a learning curve it's a learning opportunity the way mm -hmm. i see it and they can take the learning opportunity or not take the learning opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> but th this does not involve the lean concept of visual management where like you stick the card to, to the player and then you can see running around. No, oh, that kid's got a yellow. <laughs> no, you got to You got to write it down and you got to kind of remember who you get it, gave it to, but uh, uh, there is a right way to give a yellow card. And, uh, and, and, and part of it is to make sure everybody sees that, that it did in fact happen. So nobody's surprised later on. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a protocol, there's standard work for, there is there's standard work. There's a lot of standard work in, in referees uh, mm -hmm. uh, for uh, for everything from how signals work to uh, uh, to the rules, of course, the, or the laws of the game uh, themselves. But uh, including how you properly hold the yellow card, um, mm -hmm. it's it's not it's meant to be clear signal. It's not meant to be antagonistic. Yeah, it's. Um... 
it's not the the Japanese hand it with two hands protocol. It's a different protocol, I assume. No, there's no bowing involved. <laughs> I mean, maybe if it was a Japanese team, but that's probably not. Yeah, what haven't seen haven't seen that either. So they'll follow yeah. the the standard rules. So that's that's my fun. Well, cool. Um, I, so well, what about just, you? What's well, what's what's new with you? Well, I, I will, it'll be a follow up from previous discussions. Um, what I'm going to share, but I was just also going to add. Like when I was a teenager, I mean, I was really into baseball. And mm -hmm. so one of my teenage part-time jobs over the summers was uh, umpiring younger uh, Little League baseball and some softball. I remember that being a challenge because like when, when, when kids are so young, like screwy things happen. Like you've got to get oh, into yeah. the rule book about – kids running past other kids and three of them interfering with the shortstop at the same time. And like, there are things that you would not normally see in a major league game. Right. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's true. There's, and, and there's some extra rules that, that sometimes get in inserted mm -hmm. for various reasons. Uh, uh, usually for player development, sometimes for player safety, and you've got to, mm -hmm. uh, you've got to keep track of those and make sure it's like, okay, what, what age am I, am I roughly exactly. at this point? Yeah. And what are those rules? So, so, um, uh, yeah, it, it, it can get, you know, and, and really when you're coaching at a younger age, it's, you're really part, uh, you're really part coach, part ref. You're, mm -hmm. you're there for player safety, uh, but you're not, you know, enforcing the rules with the strictest of intent is, is less important than making sure the game goes smoothly. So, um, you know, nobody's getting a scholarship at five uh, at, yeah. at, or at or at nine. So uh, um, and nobody will remember who won that game. You know, people <laughs> think they will. But in the end, they really won't. I I in my head, uh, you know, I will make mistakes. I will make fewer mistakes than most of the other people on the field. Mm -hmm. And in the end, I won't really be the reason that the game ended one way or the other. So. Yeah. Well, maybe we can do an episode of my favorite mistake after a year of refereeing. I'll probably have probably have several of them. And, uh, you know, half of referee training is learning how to let them go. Right. So that's the thing. It's done. It's done and dusted. Nothing you can yeah. do about it. Can't really make up for it. And in the end, you're, you're you know, the, the rule is even if you know you made a mistake, it's final. You made them. Mm -hmm. You made the decision. You don't you don't go back and re referee the match. So, yeah. Well, so uh, what, final question about the refereeing. I mean, do you believe in the concept of makeup calls? You've made a mistake and then you mm, no. Nope, I, I, I don't, um, you know, because you'll make that's a mistake you recognize and it ignores the premise that that you've recognized all your mistakes. So mm -hmm. you're going to make mistakes both ways. Most of them are inconsequential. Uh, like most throw ins, people will complain about which direction the throw in goes, but but the majority of throw-ins change possession within seconds. Um, yeah. So, so what's, what's the big deal? Yeah. So yeah, I don't, it, the premise is, well, I recognize that I made that mistake, so I need to make up for it. Well, there's probably lots of mistakes you didn't recognize. So yeah. uh, you'll over index in one, in one way. So, you know, mistakes are part of it. And again, it's up to the players to play those conditions. Makes sense. Okay, so back to your question. So the one one thing uh, that's new, a couple episodes we had talked about how I was studying for a certification called the WSET Level 2 Spirit Certification. Last time mm -hmm. I had taken the test and I was waiting for results that they said would take 9 to 12 weeks for <laughs> the grading of an electronic test. But Jamie already knows this, but to share for the audience, I passed. I reached my goal of passing with distinction. Uh, so that's an official category. That would have meant 75% or getting 38 of the 50 uh, multiple choice questions correct. Um, I, I, I got a 100%. I aced it. Very good. Uh, <laughs> my, my, uh, my ability to remember facts and figures um, <laughs> that I don't actually use is, is pretty limited. So I highly doubt I could do that. Um, but, uh, but a hundred percent, uh, is, is, is pretty cool. Uh, the, the designation with distinction just sounds neat. Um, yeah, it says so on the certificate for what that's worth. Right. Then. And that's, I'm, I'm, I'm going to show, this is, um, Ooh. the pin, the autofocus that's, isn't cooperating, uh, but no, but that's the lapel pin. I can tell I, she's I, holding up a glass and a, a lapel pin. I think she's, um, the character on the pin is holding a wine glass because WSET primarily does wine 
right. certifications. But um, yep. but yeah, so I mean, it was a, a pandemic. I'm going to put it on. Um, it was a <laughs> pandemic. Fun, I haven't worn it yet. Um, you know, it was a pandemic fun thing. And I thought, well, if I'm going to spend a couple hundred dollars and invest the time into it, I mean, I'm competitive and driven enough of like, well, <laughs> I certainly wasn't going to do it to fail. And um, right. So yeah, I'm a little pen. very cool. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Have you uh, uh, have people started asking you questions that, uh, um, you know, extra questions uh, like, hey, my bartender did this or what, how do I make this? Or <laughs> have, they, have you started getting all the questions that come with being, being special? <laughs> um, no, but I, I do have friends that, you know, other friends I enjoy talking about um, spirits with, and I'm not going to, you know, I'm not gonna try not to be that guy who's butting in with uh, superfluous facts or, or information. <laughs> I still think it's mainly, you know, spirits or today we're going to talk about cocktails. Um, it's, it's for enjoyment. And, you know, I think, it's fun to do some learning about the process and what it is you're drinking and where it comes from and how it's made. I just, I think that's interesting too. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's uh, very interesting. I, I, I finished the uh, coffee Atlas uh, over, over vacation, which was a fun book, fun book to read. And um, yeah, it's just, it's just interesting to see how, how all that stuff comes together, especially if you enjoy the, the final product as we're, yeah often here to talk about. So, so speaking of coming together, a cocktail comes together. Yes, a, a cocktail. So, uh, we, we haven't done much of that. I, I think we've done maybe one episode with cocktails mm-hmm. before, but, but this was with a special, uh, special theme. Um, uh, and, and that was coffee and whiskey, mm-hmm. um, obviously stolen whiskey. Um, but uh, in our in our episode twenty seven, uh, we we actually switched to coffee. Uh, we did our favorite pour over. Um, in fact, I remember sitting. At, we did it in the morning, so I yeah. sat outside, yeah. um, or it was nice. And um, and so now we're kind of taking that theme, weaving it back in, and doing our favorite coffee whiskey cocktail. Yeah. So. Um, I, well, I'll say favorite. Um, it's not like I have five. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> we're learning. My here. favorite. We're learning. So this is an experiment. But this this is an experiment I did about a month ago. Really enjoyed it. Uh, I probably made it a, a three times since, and uh, only one at a you know. It's not like a uh, uh, you want to go through the whole process, but definitely um, yeah, not my favorite in the sense that I've tried a whole bunch, and this is what I've settled on. Yeah. But I, I do enjoy it. Yeah. So what is it? You haven't told the audience yet. So we have not. So this is, you know, as you can see in the martini glass, this is a yep. espresso martini um, and and it's specifically a whiskey espresso martini. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, the normal recipe, as you just get an espresso martini, is usually vodka. Mm-hmm. Uh, some people use gin, but uh, so equal parts, you know, vodka, Kahlua and freshly made espresso. Um I found a recipe that said, called it an Irish uh, espresso martini by specifically putting in Jameson, yeah. uh, which, which I, A, I didn't have, and B, don't care that it's Irish whiskey. So I guess it's really just a whiskey espresso. And what uh, whiskey did you use? I used uh, Town Branch. Um, almost had to, <laughs> almost forgot uh, yeah. what I used because I, when I was making it, I realized I hadn't hadn't thought through what I wanted to use in that particular moment, mm-hmm. but, um, I used town branch, which is, uh, I, uh, you know, a place I've actually visited. I've been to, uh, their distillery at Lexington, and, mm. uh, enjoy it. Um, but I, these days I probably use it more for, for mixing. Yeah. Um, but you, you pull a, a fresh espresso shot. Um, I put that in your mixer. No, uh, you, you have a new espresso machine as well. Right. I have a new espresso machine. It's uh, from ECM, which is a German company. Uh, it's it's uh, it's it's kind of like certain cars. It's it's much less forgiving, but <laughs> if you dial it in right, it's much better. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so this is this is not a single. This is not a push button pod you espresso don't, there's, maker. There's there's buttons, but there's yeah. multiple buttons, and uh, yeah, you don't just throw in some beans and and hit go. Um, this is, uh, uh, you know, the pressure is provided from the puck. 
Uh, so you've got to get the grind right. You've got to get the tamp right, the leveling right, uh, um, and uh, the pressure right, and all, all of that. Get the timing right. Uh, use fresh beans really makes a huge difference, and get you know get that good crema, which is actually interestingly sort of matched with the 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 cream on top of this espresso mm-hmm. martini. So mm-hmm. so uh, I've been. Is definitely, like I said, less forgiving, uh, easy to make mistakes and have, have, you know, do a poor job, but yeah. fun to dial in, fun to dial in. So, uh, so yeah, I, I made a shot with that. Um, I have some espresso bean uh, blends from Whole Latte Love, uh, which is also where I bought the machine. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so, so it, basically two ounces of, of espresso, two ounces of Kahlua. And then two ounces of town and branch bourbon. And then uh, I don't think I can tilt it properly for this camera, but uh, yeah, no, it's not going to work. But you put uh, three coffee beans float on top for good luck. Um, well, as you get so further, as you get further into that drink, maybe you can. Um, maybe you can see the show coffee us beans. later. Yeah, so you can play around with different whiskeys, different. Um, espresso blends. Um, when we talk about my cocktail, I mean, there's, there's a variable of different coffee liqueurs cause Kahlua mm-hmm. and I tasted some Kahlua the other day. I'll, I'll mention when I talk about my cocktail, like Kahlua is kind of a coffee, vanilla, chocolatey blend. Yep. Wouldn't you say? Yeah. I mean, it's specifically rum and coffee liqueur, right? Um, mm-hmm. so, uh, so it's already, uh, Kind of like Trambui or something like that. There's already some base of the the, the core uh, uh, liquor in there. In that case, rum. Mm-hmm. Um, and and you know, I don't I don't really love going out and buying a bottle of something just to try one cocktail. So mm-hmm. um, and honestly, the recipe recipe calls for that. Um, you know, I think you put an espresso and a and a full on coffee liqueur in here. It's going to be really heavy on the yeah, on the yeah. coffee well, and it already is as yeah. you know i'm actually kind of curious a bit how much changing the bourbon in this really is going to matter mm-hmm. um you know it's it's definitely tastes i've had a i've had this drink with with vodka before i can't remember where or when but it, you can definitely tell it's a bourbon drink or a, okay. a whiskey drink but um but I'm not sure with all the coffee notes, I'm not sure, sure the sure. subtleness of any any particular whiskey is really going to come through. Yeah. You're not going to use an expensive whiskey in a cocktail uh, like that, I bet. And, well, you know, the good thing about no. Kahlua, like if listeners want to experiment, uh, you can buy Kahlua very readily in the mini bottles. So right. you can do a small test of change and see if you like it. Absolutely. And, and, uh, and, and you don't, you know, it, it will make a difference, but, uh, you don't need, you know, a, a fresh, you do need a fresh espresso shot, but you know, you don't need one from a high end machine. I think any, any old espresso shot will help you make this drink. But, um, but I, 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 I think I, I can tell that this is a, a good shot of espresso in the, in the martini. So, um, yeah. a fun drink to make, um, mm-hmm. You know, it's got this froth on top and that, that allows the beans to float. And it, it, it looks nice and it's, it's fun, it's fun to drink. Great, great texture. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I do really enjoy this, but like I said, I've, I've never had an evening where I said, Oh, let me go make another one. So yeah. Yeah. It's rich. Right. And it's, 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 it's a big rich. drink too. It's uh, six ounces of, uh, liquid. Yeah. So that's six ounces of liquid and, and, uh, you know, in this, I, I still don't quite fully get the martini glass. It's not, <laughs> there's not a lot of, this is not the easiest glass to, yeah. to carry around or sip out yeah. of or anything else. Well, but well, and, and, and that drink does pack a punch because Kahlua, I just Googled it. I think is the, I think the standard Kahlua is 20% okay. alcohol by volume. There is a higher proof version of it, but yeah, the standard, so 20%, I mean, that's, I mean, like any mixer, but you know, so that, that drink does pack a punch. Great. So I'll enjoy it. I'm just a few sips in, but, um, I, and, and I'll, I'll just add, I did chill the, the glass, uh, before, before making it just, uh, 
a little ex not not usually me thinking that far ahead but i did yeah. i did give that a shot for the first time so um outside a little humid definitely a lot of condensation but it's yeah. it's a nice touch so okay uh, so what are you what are you making uh well I'll, I'll talk process a little bit and product um so when jamie and i have done cocktail episodes we, we try to be more careful about the timing because you don't want a cocktail sitting there getting warm and getting diluted and what's the timing right. so i um i'll talk about my drink and how I did some PDSA experiments um, the last couple of days. So I'll call this also a PDSA cocktail. But um, I'm drinking it in um, you know, a rocks glass with a, a big uh, ice ball. So the base recipe, um, when I was in for different coffee drinks, so uh, the cocktail is called a revolver. And the base recipe would be two ounces of bourbon or uh, rye. Some recipes call for a high rye bourbon. Half mm -hmm. ounce of coffee liqueur, a lot of people would use um, Kahlua, and then um, orange bitters. What I started playing around with, I'm calling this a Texas revolver because uh, there are some Texas ingredients. I am using uh, a Garrison Brothers High Rye Bourbon, which is one of their special releases from the past year. So it's still a bourbon, but the rye, like normally Garrison Brothers does a weeded bourbon, and this instead of wheat has a good amount of rye. Um, in the mash bill. And then instead of Kahlua, um, I went for an Austin product from Austin, Texas, um, a local distillery. I'd heard about this. It's called Cafe del Fuego Reserve. It says true coffee liqueur. Um, so they, it was about 25 bucks. Um, that, what makes it their reserve? They've got a Cafe del Fuego um, that they say is a little bit sweeter. It's 20% um, alcohol by volume. It might be closer to Kahlua. I've never tasted it. This one is 30% ABV. And as it says on the label, um, it's, it's less sweet. It's less vanilla. So like this is something like to me, Kahlua on its own would be really too sweet to drink. This yeah. I, I could imagine pouring over some ice and sort of drinking okay. it as a dessert. It's just very mildly sweet. So the PDSA cycles I went through, I started with two ounces of the Garrison Brothers, um, half ounce of the, the Cafe del Fuego and some orange bitters. And so I tasted it. And I'm like, well, it's like it's supposed to be a variation on a Manhattan. So instead of sweet vermouth, we're using um, coffee liqueur. It, it was missing a little something. And so because there's the orange bitters... I put in just a quarter ounce of uh, an orange liqueur I've been playing around with called dry curacao. So it's basically mm -hmm. a less sweet version of a Cointreau or a trip in right. any triple sec. So dry meaning, you know, it's uh, a little bit less sweet. And then I added three dashes of um, coffee bitters. And so it's not a purely Texas drink anymore. Like the coffee bitters are from Australia. Uh, this is a <laughs> French dry curacao. Right. Um, so it's, it's an international cocktail, but I, I, you know, with the, with the playing around, um, over the last couple of days and sharing tastes with, uh, my wife and mother-in-law, like, I think, yeah, I think this is the recipe I would go with. And we'll put that in the show notes. We'll call it, uh, the Texas revolver, Texas revolver. So is this, is this the first drink that you have, you have named first recipe I, that I you, think that... so. And, and, and I haven't Googled it. Somebody else has probably already called a drink. The Texas Revolver. Uh, I'm well, not a gun it, it guy, fits. but it's a fitting name. It's a fitting name, right? So it's, it's, uh, yeah, an interesting. Uh, I don't know why, you know, why revolver, but I don't really know yeah. why, why most names for, you know, yeah. Yeah. for drinks and and, um, but but yeah, using the Texas ingredients and and calling it a Texas Revolver, you know, really works. And um, you know, adding a couple extra ingredients, so. Um, so I'm guessing it's not not a very sweet. I mean, between the high rye, all the way right. through the, the the dry curacao, uh, it's probably not a very sweet drink. It's it's um, with the bitters and yeah, it's it's in it's in the boozy category of like spirit forward uh, yeah. cocktails. I did make a version the other day with um, kind of an inexpensive whiskey and Kahlua and bitters. It's a, it, you know it's a different drink. Yeah. There's more of that sweetness and vanilla. And so a lot of it's just a matter of um, palate and tastes and what you're in the mood for. If I wanted something 
less spicy uh, and, and, and sweeter, I, I would go for Kahlua instead of this uh, Cafe del Fuego. Right. Yeah, that's where it that's where it works. So um, uh, and, and interesting, just, you know, the, the, the bourbon I have isn't super sweet and mm-hmm. uh, is definitely a sweeter, a sweeter cocktail. But even just with the, the heaviness of the espresso itself, it's not yeah. not super sweet. So. And, you know, it's summertime, so maybe in the winter I would want something richer or heavier or what have you. But um, but then process-wise, you know, I stirred the cocktail, and then I I do have this double-walled insulated shaker that I basically just used as my booze thermos to keep (laughs) it it kind of cool uh, for the 15 minutes. And then putting it on on the ice ball, um, there we go. That's, that's nice. Yeah. My, mine had, had to be made, uh, uh, made fresh. So, uh, you know, the timing had to be worked out well and, and we're yeah. not going to hit pause and go make a second drink. So, no. so we might as well mention we, we did plan, uh, we did plan a, a second drink, uh, uh that, that at least keeps with a theme <laughs> and that's, right. uh, uh, David Myers cafe Olay. Yeah. Um, which, which is one of their bourbons. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, as they say, you know, notes of coffee and chocolate. Um, and, you know, since we've both been there, I've, I've, I've actually smelled the grains that go into this. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. It's, it's coffee forward. Obviously the name Cafe Olay yeah. supports that as well. So when yeah. we are ready, we'll uh, each uh, be pouring some of that. Yeah. Uh, for listeners who, who can't see the bottle, Cafe Ole, O-L-E, more of a, a Spanish flair than the Ole French yep. spelling. But quite, but quite a, not an easy drinking uh, bourbon. Um, mm-hmm. There's a, it's a, it's a mouthful. It's mm-hmm. uh there's a lot of flavor there. It's, there's some heat there. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, you know, heavy on the it's proof, good. 110 proof. So, um, uh, actually close to 111 proof, but, uh, yeah, you know, a lot of heat, a lot of flavor, a lot of flavor, a lot of flavor, very rich, not, you know, it's a sipping bourbon, but, uh, but a really good one. It's one of yeah. my favorites for sure. Yeah. So we did, so giving a bit of a preview here now that we've talked about, uh, our cocktails and we're sipping a little bit. Um, Jamie and I are going to do a, a version of in the news. We're going to talk about some articles and we're going to do it lightning round style. So it's kind of like a lean coffee format. We're going to set five minute timers and plow through what, like six articles. Uh, uh, several articles, but we'll, you know, give, giving our tendency to meander and, and wander. We'll <laughs> see, we'll <laughs> see how we do. Yeah. Um, but, but, but uh, instead of just a single article that we go off, you know, off the rails for super deep on, we'll, we'll see how that, uh, 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 see how that goes and just, you know, a bunch of different articles without even a theme. I mean, really, this is just a whole bunch of different stuff that we grabbed yeah. and, like, you know, wanted to talk about a little bit. Um, but before we, we, we get there uh, to the to the lightning round, um, you had mentioned you had a new uh, a new or at least more recent <laughs> favorite mistake. Yeah, it's not a favorite mistake. I'm still kind of hurting uh, about it a little bit, but it's, okay. it's it's a recent one. So, like last time we talked about mistakes, um, you know, kind of whiskey industry mistake stories and personal mistakes. We we're doing a bit of a, um, a a shout out to another podcast I do called My Favorite Mistake, and, right. and we, um, we had we had some fun with that one. And I'm going to plug that a little bit because David, this is coming together nicely. David Meyer. The maker of Cafe Olay was actually my guest on episode 94, uh, released very recently. And so David talks about his background at Toyota, what it was like making mistakes, dealing with mm-hmm. mistakes, building a culture where, you know, uh, he used the phrase that we've listeners have probably heard a lot. Be hard on the process, not on the people. Right. And then he talks about mistakes from uh, distilling and um, the liquor industry. So I hope people will check that out. My favorite mistake episode 94. And so Jamie doesn't know the story. And so, you know, he, he, there's an opportunity. I don't know all the answers to the background, but he can sort of play lean coach. And and there are some process related things we could talk about. Um, so, and, and, and I, I tell the story with all the love in my heart for our friends at Garrison brothers. Um, my wife and I have been members of 
a program they have called the Old 300, where it's basically a membership. You get to come to an annual event and you, you, know, you get some special perks and privileges and you're supposed to be a friend and an ambassador um, for the company and, and the product in different ways. And so with that program, uh, my wife and I were able to fill a barrel at an event seven years ago this September called uh, Bourbon Camp. And so then we had, as, as some liquor laws actually changed, thankfully, in the state of Texas, we would have the opportunity to bottle and buy contents of said barrel that we had filled and signed our names to and had patiently waited for. So like after five years, we got to taste it. We thought, it's pretty good. It wasn't overaged. Uh, talking with the master distiller, Donna's Todd, we said, okay, let's let it go another year. We'll bottle it next year. It'll probably be a little bit better, was his professional judgment. Then COVID happened, and there was no bourbon camp last year. So mm -hmm. that meant it's now, it was going to hold and be right on the verge of being a seven-year bourbon. And so we were hoping to bottle it when we go there at the, uh, the end of the month. And unfortunately, the news I heard back, and, and I had had this weird intuition, like somehow maybe the barrel accidentally got dumped into a blend. Like they had sort of lost track or they're, they're putting right. out a lot of bourbon these days. Sales are great. Right. Process problems happen. The story I woke up to the other day, and Dan and Donis were on an episode of My Favorite Mistakes. So I don't think they would murder me for uh, telling <laughs> a story about, about mistakes. Um, Don is fessed up to it, as they say their culture is, of fessing up to mistakes. The story I woke up to in the email is that you know Donis was going to pull our barrel to get it ready. That meant moving a lot of other barrels. There was a 600-pound French oak barrel that somehow fell. Thankfully, nobody was hurt, except our barrel was smashed by wow. the large 600-pound French oak barrel. And like that, seven years of waiting, the whiskey is now draining into the floor. It's right. It was, it was gone. And so we went through the stages of grief over that, of course. And um, we're, we're still trying to figure out, we may bottle and purchase the barrel that had the, the number one previous to ours. So meaning it was distilled in the same batch. It was filled right before ours. It was stored right next to ours. So the only difference between that bourbon and the one that we thought we were waiting for would be due to any small variation in the barrel. Right. Um, so we may buy it. And like when you get to do a custom label, I think I'm going to call it one off <laughs> because it is a one off single barrel that will never be recreated. And yeah, the number is one off. And minus one. And minus one. Um, well, that's, but that's sad. It, it was it was a little crushing pun yeah. intended. Um, now we may also ask them, like the alternative that might be an or or maybe an and. We've been this patient this long. Um, we may fill a new barrel and wait another four or five years. Sure. Well, it's it's yeah. I mean, you you uh, you know decided to wait the extra year. Yes, it turned into two. You know, it is uh, obviously barrel aging is also affected by temperature uh -huh. and you know and I, I don't know if we talked about this with garrison uh, on our episode but just the texas heat right, right. is gonna do something different to a barrel than it ages uh, faster than other it, it ages faster and then you also have you know as, as, as anyone who ever watched news the the texas freeze mm. <laughs> um uh, going the other direction which no facilities are really fully prepared for so no no. You put all that together and those barrels go through quite a bit in a, in a mm -hmm. short period of time. So, so maybe you don't have to wait, you know, seven years. Um, you know, maybe it's only three or four, uh, you know, the one off the N minus one, uh, those are, yeah. you know, uh, options, right. To consider, but it is one of those things for, you know, for them, it's, uh, it's, you know, there's, there's going to be some loss, right. There's, you know, you fill a barrel, you lose some, some of the juice, uh, as you're putting it in bottles, uh, you know, you taste stuff along the way. Obviously, that's yield loss. Um, you break a barrel. Okay, that's that's sad. That's there's a, a bunch of as percentage of whiskey down the drain. But but they have many barrels, right? This was your barrel. And so I, 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 I can feel you. I, we, that's a that's a tough one. 
we, we, and they were going to give us other alternatives. And we weren't looking to buy a barrel. Like it was, it's, we're, we're buying the story behind that right. particular barrel for what that's worth. But I think that, that, that was worth um, something. So, you know, I'll, I'll give, you know, I, again, I, I'll give Dan and Donis all the credit in the world. They fessed up to it. They apologized. They could have lied. And oh, part yeah. of me was like, well, they could have said, well, the barrel was a leaker because this happens. They could have taken that next barrel. They could have reef. I mean, they, they, they could have concocted a story where we would have never known, but that that's not their character. That's not yeah, no, their it's, style. It's not worth it. It's not a, uh, uh, you know, a 47 page contract either. So it's, it's not, not worth it to, to it, tiptoe down that lane. So it, it, it's not dropping a patient off the operating room table. It's not, no. <laughs> it's financial harm to them because now that product is gone. So I'm sure they're, right. they're not happy, but no. So that's, that's too bad. Um, you know, you'll, you'll still always have the story though. Um, <laughs> the story um, changed. Yeah. The story changed, but you got a beginning and an end. Uh, you might not have any whiskey right now, but uh, you, you definitely have a story. That's for sure. Yeah. And I'll, uh, I'll find a way next time we cross paths in person, if we end up, bottling and buying that barrel i'll give i'll give you one jamie yeah well well some point we're gonna have to do a an in-person lean whiskey or or at least just a, a an in-person whiskey uh, yeah yeah so um i i won't pressure you into because again i wouldn't know what the answers to this are but when you think of you know an incident like that you know if we were lean staff at a distillery or consulting like you know there would be things to talk about like you know root causes and and you know where, what you know, how did the barrel fall what are the safety risks and implications to how the process could change like jamie would, would, would you start in a3 if you were working I, I with think, them or you know this would be this would be interesting and, and i don't really i'm i'm, I'm gonna say I'm, I'm not tool agnostic uh i'm i'm not that picky about you know, what tool people use, uh, in, in the end. But, but I, I think if it was just a barrel, I would say, Hey, take a look at what happened. Go do some direct observation. Give me, give me a five Y or something. Try to get some root cause and give me an answer. I think the fact that it affected a customer, hmm. I might've asked for something more thorough, right? Because it wasn't just, you know, the barrel dropping, it was that barrel dropping, right? And, and and so you know, it's there's also something to why why did you have to move other barrels and mm-hmm. and do we should we uh, care for those barrels differently, uh, where customers have you know have their names on it and are expecting the the right after seven years to mm-hmm. to bottle it? Should we take care Good. of those differently? If we do Good take question. care of them differently, mm-hmm. do they end up tasting different? There's a lot to to that analysis. But, but I would say that, you know, because it was a customer's barrel, I probably would have asked for more than just, just a, a a quick direct observation. Um, But that would probably be the reason. Yeah. And, and, and we're, you know, uh, we're, we're not at the Gemba, so I don't want to speculate too much. Um, And, you know, first things first, again, like I'm glad nobody got hurt. I'm glad Donis didn't get hurt. Um, I do appreciate that they are open and honest about mistakes. You know, I tried to react, you know, when, when people share mistakes in the workplace, like I know it wasn't intentional. Like I didn't, I, like I said, I was going through stages of grief, but there was no point in me getting angry at them. You know, I'm empathetic to where they have a loss here. Right. You know, I know they didn't intend on doing it. I know, you know, so, um, you know, I think we can react to situations like this. Um, hopefully, with some grace. And, and again, I think me telling the story in a public way here is kind of just following the example of Don and D- Don, um, blah, Dan and Donis um, sharing mistakes and being open about that internally and, and, and publicly. And, you know, look, you know, things happen. Yeah. And in the context, you know, a year from now, the story will still exist, but the, 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 the mood won't, yeah. you know, the grief will be gone. Right. So, uh, you and, know, and, and, just, and I was just whiskey. <laughs> it's just whiskey. I was reflecting like, you know, if that's the worst thing that's happened to me that this week, uh, then I'm, I'm blessed. I have a charmed life. I mean, I was, I lost my voice. I was sick for a couple of days. I tested negative for COVID. So thankfully, um, COVID wasn't the worst thing that happened to me this week. Losing my voice for a couple of days was the worst. That's, thing, that's, but. that's hard. I'm not sure how, uh, 
how to get through get through that that would just be <laughs> i'm just gonna check out for the week and, and yeah. not even try but uh because a couple short meetings on tuesday i subjected i apologize to them for subjecting them my voice sounded pretty croaky and awful <laughs> so i apologize all right, all right you, want, well, you want to do lightning round yeah let's let's jump can, in um can, so can we see can we see the beans on the top of your glass First, can you well, tell that I see a little now bit? They're, now they're how? covering some foam, so uh, okay. they're, oh, they're oh, still oh, in there. Sp- uh, whoops! Yeah, it's just a it's just a few drops, but okay. um, yeah, they're they're now they've now been absorbed by the foam, so uh, yeah, they're lost in the foam. All right, they are lost in the foam. All right, but that also means it's time for me to you, you can pour, pour some, some cafe away while I'm uh, introducing. This segment, so we're going to do kind of a lightning round version of In the News. I am using the new Zoom app called Timer, which is a timer. And I'm going to set a five-minute timer. Um, The first story is one that uh, Jamie brought to the discussion. We've both read these. And like our our point here is not to do a a point-by-point review of the article, but to use the topic um, as a starting point. So the headline of this article, this was from Reuters. More U.S. companies tie CEO pay to diversity metrics, says a study. So, Jamie, I'll let you take the lead here. Yeah. So, you know, obviously the the idea is, you know, how many things uh, can we uh, incentivize executives, in this case specifically CEOs, to to do better at, right? Uh, Just even even the, the task of aligning CEO pay to uh, to shareholder interest isn't straightforward. It's, it's complicated. It's, you know, we kind of say, well, you know, give them shares and then their, their incentives are aligned. But uh, you've even seen not, not one of our stories, but uh, I believe the SEC came out about uh, some of the shareholder uh, selling plans, which are meant to protect from insider saving, uh, uh, ins- trading. insider trading mm-hmm. are, are, are weak. And so they're proposing maybe maybe relooking at those. So, you know, it's it's a complicated field getting these incentives right, getting pay right. For, uh, but the the trend is uh, for a bunch of things. How do we how do we put some of these uh, other variables into CEO pay? And this is really around diversity. Mm-hmm. Um, so so I think you know just on the surface. Um, it, it just immediately, not not the article, but the fact that you've done it, um, makes a statement, right? It, it elevates the importance of it, not as a nice to have as long as it doesn't interfere with the business, or as long as you don't think it interferes with the business. But this is actually important enough to pay you on on that on that factor. So I, I think that's a good start. Now. Um, the other thing I'll say right out of right off the bat is that um, you know diversity. You know we we refer to diversity often these days as DEI, diversity, equity, well, and inclusion. It goes beyond diversity. Yeah, it goes beyond diversity. Uh, the whole idea is that and and a, and a favorite uh, uh, illustrative quote that uh, I heard actually at a, an ACD uh, event years ago was from uh, General Lester Lyles, who's a uh, former Air Force general, um, and I don't know if he still is currently the chair of the board of USAA or, or mm-hmm. was at the time. He was at the time. But he said diversity without inclusion is just an illusion. Mm-hmm. And and what, what he's getting at is like you hire a bunch of people in underrepresented classes, but they're not really involved. They're not really included oh, in right. – Decision making, day to day work, the cool so then, jobs. So then, what's the benefit if they're not? So then, included? what's the benefit? Right, right. right. Then it's you. You, you feel it. You know. Then it. Then it felt like charity, right? Uh, because yeah. you were giving somebody a job, just versus checking a box. In, yeah, just checking a box instead of including them in the company, and and so you know, fundamentally, I think there's uh, you know a lot more focus for those that are trying to advance the issues. A lot more focus on uh, on on both equity, which is more outcomes driven, and inclusion, which is more process and culture mm-hmm. driven. Mm-hmm. Um, but diversity, of course, has been around longer as as a focal point, um, but it's also easier to measure. 
Yeah. And, and, uh, it, you know, and so that's perhaps why that's the thing you start to tie to pay. It, it's easier to count and categorize people. But what, one thing that came to mind to me in the article, like there, there are leading indicators and lagging indicators. So you can have a process metric or a leading indicator around diversity. Then that, I think there's a lot of ev- there's evidence and data and studies from McKinsey and others, and you can just believe that if we have a more diverse board, if we have a more diverse leadership team, we were, will better reflect our customer base. Therefore, we will perform better. Then the lagging indicator, the outcomes measure, is profit. And to your point, they're already incentivized around results. Does right. incentivizing around a different dimension of process it, it, is it necessary or is it doubling down on something that's the uh, the right direction? Yeah, and, and I think some of it's based on, well, two factors. One, blind spots, um, you know, the, the ability to see uh, the effect on on profit and that, that, you know, having a blind spot around that means that you're, you know, you might need a little extra attention. The second is time, right? So meaning that, uh, you know, working on it, this quarter isn't going to affect this quarter's uh, financial performance, most likely, and it's more about long-term performance. and 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 there is a bit of uh, uh, bias towards shorter-term gains, which is a whole whole another Wall Street topic. Yeah. All right. There's there's an experiment with our timer. Like this is like the uh, the show. Um, okay, stop. <laughs> This is like the show, uh, pardon the interruption, which, which, you know, yes. uh, on ESPN, they have a timer. They, they, the bell goes off, they run a little bit over, but you know, it's TV. They only have 22 and a half minutes. So they have to uh, keep it going fast paced. You have to keep going. So we'll, we'll try to honor the, we'll try to honor the bell. Yeah. So that article and all of the others will be linked to in the show notes and the web pages for the episode here. So the second article, it's about job switchers and pay increases. Um, This is from ADP, the payroll company that put out an article um, based on data they have. The headline reads, wage growth among U.S. job switchers, and there are a lot of them, that's just my added comment, Um, wage growth increased 5.8% since June 2020 as businesses struggle to attract workers. And so the article talked about um, how people are changing jobs for better pay. And I think, you know, there are a couple of things that come to mind. Like one, I mean, you know, part of the headline here, businesses struggle to attract workers. Like my bias is that when I hear that or I see on social media a restaurant that's put up a sign that says nobody wants to work. Like I add in the phrase, nobody wants to work at the wages and the conditions this business is offering. Mm -hmm. So there are different levers the company could use to better retain and better attract, you know, to become an employer uh, of choice. So I said, well, if businesses are struggling to attract workers. It sounds like they're also struggling to keep them if people are switching jobs for better pay. Yeah, it's, it's, um, you know, I think there's a lot of people, uh, and, and there's some data that suggests this is true. Uh, a lot of people wanted to leave, but in COVID were, uh, uh, you know, afraid of losing their mm-hmm. income or just job searching was hard because, you know, you did Zoom interviews and stuff. So they just hung out and 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 bought their time. So you have uh, you have a bit of just like you have a pent up demand for a bunch of things. You have a pent up demand for job switching mm-hmm. uh, with natural job switching. Um, uh, people's attitudes have changed around what's important to them. Uh, mm-hmm. And the pandemic has had an effect on on, on sure. that. Um so, so I think there's been some, some, and, and a lot of the jobs are harder uh, for for various reasons, right? Like if you're in supply chain and you're trying to get a hold of containers in Asia to ship stuff, like your job's just harder than it ever was mm-hmm. before. So, so there's a whole bunch of reasons, uh, structural reasons, structural mm-hmm. reasons mm-hmm. that will will stick around for a while. Why, why some of this churn is is very very real, mm-hmm. and. You know, most people, you know, when you really look at some of the underlying long term research will not uh, consistently switch jobs for for better pay. Um, But in a market where there is shortages, if they're going to switch jobs, they might as well get paid more in the process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And and we're seeing, uh, you know, we're seeing companies that, you know, have 
you know, they have this many wrecks open. They, they, they fill half of them, but people leave and they're still stuck where they started. Like they've mm-hmm. made zero yeah. progress, which, which does speak to retention being super important. Everything you can do to keep the employees you have, um, uh, should be important. Uh, but, um, you know, fundamentally, you know, what else besides pay, uh, are you, you know, to your point around the restaurant, like what other reasons should somebody come to work for you? Mm -hmm. And that, that, that becomes a a pretty important factor. Yeah. And we're going to come back with another article later about working conditions in, in restaurants. But, you know, I think of this dynamic where, you know, uh, an organization, regardless of the industry is short on staff, um, one lever is to boost wages to attract new employees. Now you've got to be careful about inequities between new people being paid more to do the same job than people have been around for a while. If those people start learning about that, they may very understandably get ticked off and leave and go someplace else for a wage. And now the cycle continues. And, and this is like the uh, the new commercials from Verizon and, and AT&T, right? It's- we're, we're not just going to give better deals to new customers. <laughs> we're going to give them to existing customers too. Um, and we may, you know, when you have lots of employees, you kind of go, oh, we're just going to increase wages by $3 an hour. And then you do the math and you're like, times this number of employees, times this many hours. That's a, that's a big shift, right? But yeah, this it, is what's driving, you know, this is in part, I'll say, keeping up with inflation. Uh, inflation's a little unchecked right now. Um, you know, central banks are, are, are gonna, you know, they're, they're quite frankly all over the map in terms of how clear they are on will inflation really settle down or, or, or do we need to act? Um, right now they're not acting. So we'll see. I'll, I'll say, I'll say this also, cause a lot of people will say, oh, it's just the unemployment incentives, but, uh, you know, and, and I think there is a factor there. I, I think that's an ingredient. Uh, in terms of not being able to hire everybody you could. But we've seen countries where those have ex- long since expired. They did the same thing, and they're still having trouble too. So this is more than just a, a an unemployment benefits concern. So there are all kinds of factors. And you know, the job conditions thing includes the risks that people face, whether it's in healthcare or in restaurants or in jobs where you're facing – um, a lot of um, different customers, people are taking that into consideration these days. So yep. important topics. And as with a lot of things, no easy answers, but uh, we're going to move on. No easy answers. Got to keep grinding on that on that employment. Uh, I don't think there's a single client I'm talking with that isn't, isn't looking to hire some folks right now. So yeah. a lot um, of hospitals are... Um, Short on staff, they're bringing, you know, for d- increased demand, um, people leaving the profession, there are all kinds of factors mm-hmm. in this latest Delta variant driven wave of the pandemic. It's it's tough yeah, for a lot yeah, of hospitals and, I, and healthcare professionals. And I think, you know, times are go- going so well, since, you know, ever since the uh, 2008, 2009 financial crisis, a lot of people are like, yeah, I want to retire, but things are pretty easy and good right now. Why should I? And well, yeah. COVID hits and now there's a reason. So it's, uh, you know, it definitely led to some retirements as well. So uh, I guess speaking of hiring, uh, where do you want to hire from? Um, (laughs) So it's an interesting article about uh, Starbucks is the new talent factory powering corporate America, which, which is interesting because there's always a fad. I'll call it a fad because it it comes and goes and it's usually not very data driven about, you know, oh, I'm from this company. Well, that's an automatic plus in your column mm-hmm. on the resume. You know, GE was this for a long time. Right? Mm-hmm. There's lots of ex-GE people running around. There was lots of ex-Honeywell, Danaher, Toyota. There's lots of places that you want it. You're, mm-hmm. you're almost as better off being from than at. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so it's interesting to see Starbucks is uh, – is is now basically at that point where you know lots of people are are trying to poach Starbucks employees at all levels, right? Mm-hmm. So we had we had talked about uh, Rosalind Brewer before. She's she was COO at Starbucks, hired as CEO of Walgreens. I, I think it says a lot to say we care about customer experience, which is you know more so than product and price was really what 
Starbucks has been all about was customer experience. And I, you know, besides, you know, Rosalind Pruer's uh, talents and leadership uh, credentials, kind of like, well, why from Starbucks? Well, customer experience starts to uh, uh, pave the way. And, and so I think there, there's a lot there's a lot of merit behind, you know, why Starbucks? Because they, they get at least mm-hmm. that factor right. Well, and I mean, I think there's this question of like, I'm, I'm a regular Walgreens customer. It's fine. Like they're, they're, they're fine. Like, I don't know if anyone's really a raving fan of Walgreens. So I wonder like, you know, does bringing in one executive give you a fighting chance of getting that Starbucks culture? Now to answer my own question. Now I think if you're bringing in someone like Rosalind Brewer as CEO, that means a lot, but it's going to, I think it, it, it would take time. She's got to evaluate existing culture, existing leadership, look for gaps and, you know, uh, th- change, change does take time. Yeah. And, and especially in an organization as distributed as whether it's a Starbucks or a Walgreens, right? You have a lot that comes into local store management and, and obviously, there, there's product and procedures and training that that, that provides some stability across a large distributed enterprise like that, which is why you get some of the consistency that you do. But you know, I'll say this, and I haven't, you know, I, I just we already talked about my at home yeah. espresso machine. I don't go to Starbucks <laughs> anymore um, uh, for a whole bunch of reasons. But you you can say that the consistency of delivery of experience from one Starbucks to the next is mm-hmm. pretty solid. Um, and, and, uh, you know, I don't know much about Walgreens from that standpoint, but, uh, you know, they've certainly gotten a lot of that, right. I know lean's been a part of that, but, but they started getting that right even before they, uh, yeah. they did, they did some. I, mean, I think it's interesting. Work. I mean, cause you've got Walgreens and a lot of times there's a CVS right across the street. It's like Coke and Pepsi. It's like AT&T and Verizon. I mean, like really how different are they? You get kind of locked into one or it becomes a habit for, for different reasons. Like Starbucks, I mean, obviously Starbucks has competitors, but Starbucks is really dominant other than smaller chains, local, they, they, they don't have, I, I, you know, CVS and Walgreens are basically the same store with a different font on the signage. (laughs) And, you know, they, right. it's more, they're probably more equal size. I, I'm, I'm just talking, pulling that out of thin air. Yeah, I, I think, I, I think it is a very different experience and, um, and, you know, but, but Starbucks got to that point, right? Now they, they got there quite a while ago, but um, I think there are a lot of ingredients that, uh, that can come to a Walgreens and, and change what that is, but it, you know, it does, you know, in the limited time we have left on this topic, just the whole idea of, hey, you know, GE's good. Uh, you're from GE. You mm-hmm. must be good, too. Yeah. Um, hey, Starbucks is good. Yeah. You're from Starbucks. You must be good, too. And and there's, uh, you know, overlap with one of your previous employers. I mean, there were some GE people who had been very successful at GE and failed spectacularly in different companies. I'm going to throw rocks at Robert Nardelli because he flamed out at Home Depot. And I don't know what you think about what he did uh, with Chrysler when they were owned by private equity, but. He, he, he bombed pretty, he bombed pretty hard. Um, uh, He wasn't the right guy. He didn't know really what he was doing. Um, And, and I think that the, 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 one of the key, and I, I look at GE people for this, and I've met, you know, I don't know how many GE, ex-GE people, but they were part of an ecosystem, right? right? And, and, and if you don't know how to build that ecosystem where you show up, um, then, you know, is it like you just, you, you were successful within that ecosystem, but you go to an ecosystem that doesn't have all those support mechanisms, can you be successful? Or... Do you know how to right. build it? And I've seen I've seen people leave you know places like Intel that have you know lots of ecosystem Toyota. behind it. Uh, you know, to- people leave Toyota uh, and and just again flame out really really badly because they were dependent on what their organization yeah. gave them rather than able to replicate it. And I think that you know if you're interviewing somebody on the premise that they're coming from one of these big, big companies replicating yeah. what they have 
versus operating within it are yeah. two very and different And so there's that question of what's transferable. The final comment I'll make is an appeal to people in healthcare to please sometimes think outside the box and hire somebody from another industry. Like there's one of the Henry Ford health system hospitals in the Detroit area in um, Bloomfield, which you, you know from your time in Detroit, Bloomfield is a very upscale, Bloomfield yep. Hills, West Bloomfield, very upscale suburb. And they hired as hospital CEO uh, somebody who had, um, I forget if it was the Four Seasons or the Ritz, but they had hotel experience. Now, that chafes the healthcare people who say, well, this is not a hotel. Well, it, the hospital is not a hotel, but I think there's something to be said for leadership and customer focus. And you know, I, I would be curious to see what one of these Starbucks executives might do running a hospital. Yeah, oh, I think it'd be, I think it'd be interesting. In the end, you know, you're not, you have to appreciate the work that yes. experts do. Uh, you, it doesn't mean you have to, you know, be able to do it right. Just like a, you know, a, 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 a uh, CEO of any hospital, even mm -hmm. if they were a doctor didn't learn right. every discipline, right? They might be familiar with it. They might appreciate it, but it's, you know, they, they didn't, they didn't master every little trade in the medical field. So they, 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 they mastered one and there's some underlying consistencies yeah. for sure. But I mean, sometimes the difference between, um, I, you know, general treatment or I'll say operating room versus, mm -hmm. you know, a surgeon versus, um, an ICU is perhaps as big a difference as between an ICU sure. and a hospital, so, sure. or I mean a hotel. So yeah, uh, yeah. Sometimes leadership yeah. is all you need. All right. So the next article this comes from HBR. The headline asks a question. We'll talk about it. When do we actually need to meet in person? So I'll, I'll add a couple thoughts here. You know, as, as a consultant, uh, I am still not yet back on site with healthcare clients. It's been eighteen months. Um, I, I might, like there's a proposal waiting to be responded to. I might get to resume doing mainly some virtual coaching with the last on-site client that I had that was interrupted by the pandemic in March 2020. Um, but there's, 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 there's so much in flux right now with the Delta variant and how are things progressing. Um, the, the, the design of, of, of the engagements to so do a lot of virtual coaching and then do one visit in person in the middle. But... You know, I, I already have relationships with a lot of the people involved, which I think would tee up virtual coaching to be more successful than something that would maybe try to start off as virtual culture coaching. What, 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 what are you doing these days? Yeah. So I guess from my personal experience, um, and I, I'm a hundred percent virtual or uh, remote and, and for the most part intend to be, um, mm. permanently. Uh, it has nothing to do with COVID, but if I'm coaching somebody every two to four weeks, I'm not flying halfway across the country for an hour long conversation. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't make any sense. And, and trying to wait and pack it all in, in one day, once a quarter doesn't make any sense either. So, yeah. And it's not about what's right or wrong, but for work I do, which a lot of which is, is coaching executives uh, at a very, you know, one-on-one -on -one level, it, virtual makes a ton of sense. And, Quite frankly, if you if you really invest your energy into this and do it right, I mean, I have some very trusting relationships with people that mm -hmm. I've never met in person. Um, now, I am planning a possible road trip where, you know, in part, it's mostly social. Like, let me let me come and have a, have right. a lunch or see you in person and, and all of that, you know, help either build or maintain relationships. But um uh, but, but, but fundamentally, you know, I, I think at least I've proven to myself <laughs> that I can, I can build trusted, uh, engaged relationships yeah. remotely. Um, now, now that being said, as you know, that's just me, uh, there are reasons mm -hmm. to be in person, uh, a sense of connection, culture, uh, is, is easier, unstructured collaboration, Right. So uh, I think structured collaboration, we can figure out uh, quite well. Um, but uh, in fact, some some ways doing it virtually has been better for people, yeah. for organizations. But the unstructured, the random hop in, grab a yeah. whiteboard, you know, on, uh, that kind of collaboration is, yeah. is a bit harder. 
So there's definitely some benefits mm-hmm. to being in person some of the time. But, but watching companies in their return to the office efforts, uh, which some have taken a back step, a backward step uh, due, to, right. due to Delta, some have hit pause, some are you know, past the point of no return, essentially, in terms of moving forward. But, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm really dismayed, I think, at, at how many aren't really using mm-hmm. what was learned and carrying those lessons forward, that, that we're just going to go back and, you know, sit a bunch of people in a conference room, pop open some PowerPoint, and off we go. And that would be a shame. Well, there, there are certain issues, whether it's in-person or virtual, uh, that come to mind. So like two organizations that I work with a lot. One is Kinexus, a software company that Jamie um, knows very well and is an investor and advisor in, uh, like uh, advisor to like I am. There's Value Capture, a consulting firm that I do a lot of work through. So Kinexus does a twice a year annual meeting. So there's there's the day-to-day office life that with, that a lot of people are craving to get back to and there will be benefits from. But then there's the twice a year meetings where we've got a team that's split mostly between Dallas and Austin. We've got some people in different places that twice a year, everyone get together for a couple of days is important. If anything, because of the social aspect, Kinexus is growing and adding mm-hmm. a lot of people you got, it, I think, you know, so when we do these biannual meetings, Kinexus, I'll give a lot of credit, tries to build in fun time, breakout sessions. Let's get to know each other. Let's share things. But with both organizations, and this is true even when it's an in-person meeting, I've tried to advocate for like, if you're going to bring 20 or 30 people together, don't sit and passively watch people's PowerPoint updates. Like those could be recorded and shared yeah. in advance asynchronously, or just share the PowerPoint. And then let's use the time together in person for social discussion, like things that are really a lot more interactive. I keep I keep banging that drum. Well, and, and, I, and I think I think that's important um, to, to say, you know, that this isn't it used to be like, oh, this is my one chance to get in front of these people and show them something. Well, that's what email is. Right? Uh, sure. This is your sen- This is your chance to have a sense of connection, some collaboration, some culture. Use it for the right purpose. If you're going to bother to bring people together, and that includes, you know, not just your semi-annual events. That includes your day-to-day stuff. Is why am I bringing people together? What am I supposed to get out of this? Um, I'll, I'll 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 just add this 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 uh, this note is I do think some companies. And, and, and we need more to, to really be thoughtful mm-hmm. about asynchronous work and uh, you know, how some of the stuff we used to do that, that really should be asynchronous. Um, you know, my, my assistant, uh, Susan, mm-hmm. uh, assistant and client uh, account support, um, you know, we, we meet once a week and we meet for the stuff that we couldn't figure out yeah. asynchronously. But Everything else is on Trello, notes back and forth, comments, questions, feedback, all sorts of stuff happens asynchronously. And then we, we really, we save the, face, the face-to-face time, even though it's over Zoom, uh, to, to, be, uh, to, to be the stuff that requires yeah. dialogue. So. I, I think either way, the learning means instead of going back to the way it was, we've got to find a new normal that's better. We should be improving the structure of meetings yeah. and all hands meetings, whether they're weekly or quarterly or biannually. Um, let's let's figure out how to do it better. Uh, please, please, please don't go back to the yeah. way things yeah. were. <laughs> That's our message. All right. So I think we've got two more so, articles uh, teed up. Yep. So next one is uh, uh, how lean thinking and practice help put shots in arms. Uh, part one, building the process. And there's part two as well. But this is actually from the Lean Enterprise Institute talking about, you know, specific case of of really using lean to to improve the process of, mm-hmm. of putting shots in arms. So it wasn't it wasn't a um, an analogy for anything. Directly, it was actually right. putting shots in arms vaccine. in this case, yeah. which yep, which was uh, uh, you know obviously a process that had to happen both. Um, I don't say flawlessly because that's that's the wrong term, but had to happen sure. effectively, right, more than anything, safely, but also had to happen in high volume 
with little mm-hmm. chance to experiment um, before, before yeah. uh, but, you know, and very little background yeah. for but, how to yeah, do this I, well. I did talk to organizations that did, even though a lot of this was um, very urgent, if not uh, like just very short windows, you have two weeks to put together in the mass vaccination process, go. Um, and different discussion of should that have been such a scramble? We should have anticipated more. But um, there were organizations that did process simulations of the layout and the flow and the workstations. Yes. And, and, and that was great. That was a great contribution for lean thinking. I mean, these articles from LEI, uh, Peter Ward um, was writing about work done in his backyard at Ohio State Health, um, the, the academic medic- medical center affiliated with um, the hospital. And a lot of what I read there lined up what I saw when I got to do Gemba visits. Um, there, there was a site um, in San Diego where one of the people involved in designing the process was a former Toyota NUMI leader. Great process design, better results. Uh, in Frisco, Texas, the city of Frisco, which has an ongoing lean program, I provided some lean training and um, coaching um, to a couple parts of uh, city government. They have a great effort in the library. So their lean leader from the library was partnered up with local Toyota, North American headquarters, right the next city over. Um, Great process design background, plus continuous improvement. I mean, the lesson I learned, as with everything, better process design meant better throughput, fewer errors, less risk of errors, more engaged staff meant the refinement, the ongoing continuous improvement of the process. Um, Even the Toyota Frisco team didn't design a perfect process. They realized early on, oh, there are some things we didn't realize. And that's okay. They engaged people and they did some Kaizen. They did some improvement. That's how it's supposed to work. Yep. Yeah. And it's, it's, um, and, and I think that's, that's the key, even though this process was not meant to be a permanent one for most of right. the high volume places. Like I went to a, to a dry mm-hmm. soda mm-hmm. clinic at Dorney I, park. I, I've been to Dorney park, park as a kid. <laughs> been to Dorney park. Dorky park. And, we um, called it. Sorry. You know, not, not, <laughs> okay. Not, not far from, yeah. from, yeah. from my house. And, and, um, and, and it was, it was incredible. Uh, it really was. And um, in terms of the efficiency and the flow, and I didn't mean, I, I, I didn't even feel like there was a couple of points where I turned off my car out of, out of sort of respect mm-hmm. for the mm-hmm. people around me. But there's a lot, a lot of chances mm-hmm. I had to turn off my car. I just kept moving from one stage to the next. And, and even little things where, you know, they, like they put Mark on my, my windshield, both, uh, mm-hmm. they put a one on it and, um, and then when I got the shot, they put the time on it so that the other people could know when to let me go, um, let me leave. And, and we thought the one meant, oh, this is my first shot. And then, then I figured out one later. one person um, getting a shot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Met one person mm-hmm. in the car. <laughs> um, so that, you know, as they see you coming, oh, here's a, here's a one shot car. Here's a two shot car. Um, and that, you know, those things help quite a bit. And I think what's key is, you know, how much do you invest in a process um, knowing it's temporary? Right? That, I think that I think is, is very interesting here is that you knew this was a temporary process. You knew you weren't doing mm-hmm. this for, for years. So, so at least, you know, I, I guess you don't feel bad that you're putting time into a process that's going to end, but you also know that you, oh. you have a limited time to figure this out and you can't, you know, it's not that you don't have the money for well, the capital, you, no, well, the time I, I would invest in process. I would invest in continuous improvement. I wouldn't invest in capital, right? So you can rent tents right. um, to provide shade, for example. But um, like when, when I went through the drive through at Dodger Stadium, they did the same mark on the window because my wife came with me. I drove. She was in the passenger seat. They marked one on the windshield because um, I, I was eligible um, – I had a letter. I, I, I think I legitimately qualified as a healthcare worker. I wasn't trying to be the first healthcare worker by any means, but with somebody who might have to go back on site at hospitals. Um, my wife came along because it was the end of the day. I'm like, hey, if you have any extra doses, and you know, they, they didn't, and that's fine. They had a tightly managed process around that. But what they didn't do 
was write any sort of time on the window because I was part of a batch of 10 cars was how they chose to manage it. And I saw a similar thing in San Diego as opposed to designing a process where each car could pull out and, and leave when your own 15 or 30 minutes uh, were up. That's mm-hmm. a matter of process design. And are you thinking about like, let's right. not keep people here longer than they need to be versus like, meh, it's a batch, eh, it's an extra 10 minutes, who cares? Like, so that's just a matter of mindset and figuring it out. Yeah, and 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 the types of resources you had, um, you know, when you have more volunteers who can manage traffic than you have that can stick needles into arms, then let's minimize the work of the tight resource and and uh, push some of that work to other groups like those that are managing traffic. Which uh, again, there was lots of volunteers. Uh, coming forth from, from within the hospital and beyond to help help with some of those but processes. Final thought, so. I'll add, I, I know you and I agree on this. And I've done a couple, of, I've been part of a couple panels and given a, a presentation about uh, lean and, and vaccination. And like we knew vaccines were coming. Like organizations in the U.S. might have been a little bit surprised that, oh, it's coming sooner than we thought. And, 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 and you know, rather mm-hmm. than throw rocks at other people, like I... I wish I had been, let's say, advocating for what it was worth if I could have had an impact uh, last August of let's design the high level process now. Like everybody in hospitals in the U.S. and Canada was given a detailed standard work for here's how you prepare and give the vaccine. Nobody at the CDC or the American Hospital Association or the Society for Health, um, Health Systems Nobody designed like here's the here's what we think is a pretty good starting point for how to set up a drive through mass vaccination clinic. Like everybody was figuring it out on their own. And I'll, I'll give credit to the team mm-hmm. at Kinexus and to Helen Zach at Value Capture, where we did stand up some meetings so people could collaborate and learn from each other through a, a limited version right. of the Kinexus software. We did a weekly Zoom call because people were hungry to compare notes and learn from other organizations. And so like, it didn't need to be such a fire drill of like, you got 10 days, go. Like, oh, we should have been planning months ago, set the plans aside until, okay, now you have uh, two weeks before vaccines are gonna arrive, do the final prep. And, and, And maybe have a starting point, then we could have had a lot of local innovation and then sharing of those ideas back across different organizations. Yeah, no, I, I I agree. So no need to, uh, no need to build on that point because I'm I'm fully yeah. on board. So, <laughs> so uh, as we cover yeah. our last article, um, you know, an industry uh, affected to the same degree as healthcare, um, maybe in a very different way, uh, but but certainly the same degree as as the restaurant industry. Uh, most, of course, were shut down. Many are still trying to figure out how to how to open up, um, but the article from New York Times is uh, restaurants will never be the same. They mm-hmm. shouldn't be, um, and and this was uh, really um, I, I, I think an indictment on both internal restaurant culture, mm-hmm. meaning how they're run, uh, but also a bit of of customer expectations, culture, right, yeah. and how we expectations and, 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 uh, and how we treat, um, how we treat people in the restaurant industry, uh, as, as, you know, it's service, it's not servant. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, some of how the customer, uh, expectations and uh, reinforcement of those expectations come out and that, that the industry, the industry, uh, needs to change and essentially is in many ways being forced to change. Yeah. And, you know, there, there are elements of that culture. Um, I have not worked in a restaurant Gemba um, since I was 15 years old and I worked for like two or three months over the summer at a Taco Bell. So that's at, we'll call that the low end of the restaurant spectrum. But this article from the New York Times talked about Michelin star restaurants at the other end of the spectrum where abuse gets rationalized as like, well, it has to be this way, or that chef's a genius, so that's what you have to put up with. Or like people are so willing to put a certain restaurant on their resume 
that they'll they'll suffer through that abuse. And like it doesn't have to be that way. I'll be idealistic about it and say, look, it's just it, people deserve to be uh, treated well and not abused, regardless of the price range of the restaurant and. Yeah, I mean, let, let's face it. Most chefs uh, set the menu. They don't actually cook most of the food. Um, and, and so why don't we uh, why don't we raise the bar on chefs who run a great mm-hmm. culture in their restaurant like we do in about any other yeah. <laughs> any other field? And, um, you know, I, I think they are. I forget if this was brought up in the article. I think it was, you know, the whole whole TV show, Gordon right, Ramsay. Right, I'm going to berate right. you. And uh, you know, destroy you, and 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 you're going to be thankful because you're <laughs> yes, now going to be better for it. <laughs> is there um, whatever yes, it is? Just yes, yes chef. Ugh. Yes, chef. And and you know, and even the military has mm-hmm. largely uh, discredited that as a training yeah. technique. Um, you know, not entirely, but but um, but but certainly from a from a oh that's that's how you break people down and build them back up. And, and certainly the restaurant industry has, has seen a lot of that and, and, and talking to folks that I know they're in on, on top of that, the, the sexism, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, which is perhaps they're worse than the racism specifically for that industry, but both are there for sure. And uh, I, you know, these are things that just, sort of suggests that the restaurant industry has is is a couple decades mm-hmm. behind some yeah. of the other fields of work. And you know the article talked about customer expectations that we maybe we expect too much for too low of a price. And then that leads to a lot of cases kind of a race to the bottom of cheapening out on ingredients, understaffing, doing things that aren't really complicated system dynamics situations where you're like, oh okay, that's not going to be good for the business. But, you know, my wife and I, I can think of cases of restaurants that we've frequented a lot and been loyal to. Like when we lived in Phoenix, Pizzeria Bianco has an award-winning chef, uh, Chris Bianco. And like the four years that we were regulars at that restaurant, when we lived there, there was like zero turnover in staff. And I'm like, to me, that's a good sign. This must be a good workplace. Like at one point I had an idea that I was, I wanted to write like a fast company article um, you know, like, you know, interviewing people and trying to figure out like there's there's something about the culture at Pizza Row Bianco. It's not just the food. And you can tell, like, well, obviously, people are choosing not to leave and people seem to really sincerely enjoy working there. It wasn't um, it wasn't a bad environment. Well, and, and, and that's, you know, as far as the race to the bottom, it's, you know, we expect the best ingredients, we expect hmm. farm to table ingredients, we expect McDonald's speed. Um, we expect, you know, Michelin star service. Um, you know, we expect all of the ingredients at every interaction and, and, and we're, it shows we're not, you know, not, we're not willing as consumers to make trade-offs and, you know, to a degree that's, I'll say that's fair. I mean, consumers raise the bar and ultimately set, set the terms of, of competition. Um, but you know, the, the other side of it is, you know, if we're only voting with, a, with our pocketbook, mm-hmm. that's one thing, right? We're, we're only, you know, choosing this restaurant over another, then that's, that's, that's the game of competition. But wh- when it comes to how we express our dissatisfaction or satisfaction, um, you know, I've become, I'll say, I'll, I've become more aware of restaurants that I think do a great job, but also, don't do a consistent job. And am I okay with that? And, and, and that's not, you know, this is a one-off restaurant owned by one person. You know, there, there's not a corporate training center. There's not, there's not a lot behind it. It's, it's this guy in the kitchen doing what he can do and he does a great job, but it's not going to be consistent every time. Maybe that's okay. So like a lot of, industries or situations, can we choose to do business at a place that provides, like I think of uh, the professor from MIT Sloan, Zainab Tan, who wrote a great book called The Good Jobs, is it called The Good Jobs Principle? The, uh, 
It sounds sounds right. Something uh, along but, those lines. Uh, it's the Good Job Strategy is the book. Um, ah, there you and go. I've yes. interviewed her in my Lean podcast. But like one of the companies featured in that book is Costco. Um, one of the companies, uh, gas station, convenience store chain, that is pretty um, uh, prevalent here in Texas called uh, Quick Trip. I will go out of my way and drive further, not because I'm getting a decent price on the gas, but I am trying to choose and support a company that seems to be offering not just a good wage to their employees, but there are different dimensions of what she calls the good job strategy of, of basically being, frankly, you know, just a better workplace environment. And when I, when I, it, but we don't know, right? So when I know about it, I can try to um, vote with my uh, wallet, but we don't always know. What's hiding behind the scenes in the kitchen? No, and that's, we, yeah, we don't always see that. And, um, you know, for us, it's Wawa. Yeah, that's our mm-hmm. our uh, Pennsylvania, Eastern Pennsylvania, New Jersey uh, um, uh, go-to place. But there was a restaurant near us. It's closed since, uh, mostly because the, the owner retired. Um, but the staff was always yeah. the same staff. And, and you know, there's no place that I tipped higher, more consistently than there just because I just knew that they were, they were all doing a good job with what they had. And it wasn't always consistent. It wasn't even for the quality of the service. It was kind of like for what they were working with and the, 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 the culture that, that seemed mm-hmm. to exist there, even though it's just yeah. five people. So um, those things, those things uh, certainly have yeah. an impact. So hopefully we can, can all be more uh, understanding, thoughtful and, uh, you know, if we if we don't like a place, don't don't yeah. buy it anymore. It was, we don't need to go raise the bar to other other ways to express yeah. our dissatisfaction. Well, I think we're not dissatisfied with uh, the cocktail we made or the cafe au lait, right? No, I'm, I've uh, uh, poured a little more in my my glass, but uh, <laughs> so technically on on beverage number three, uh, both are very good. Uh, good conversation, I, I think. Uh, uh, I, I thought, oh, we're just going to do quick hit topics. Maybe uh, this will be a short episode, but it, it, eh, not so much. It could be the whiskey okay. talking, but we've kind of run on an hour and a half here. But, well, we do that sometimes. So We do. The, we, do we, we do appreciate do people sometimes. listening. Um, as we've talked about before, I mean, you know, Jamie and I do the podcast because we enjoy it. We like doing it and talking to each other, and uh, we're, we're happy anyone listens. So thank you for that. Absolutely. So a quick hit. Why don't we, why don't we quick hit our no timer. question? Um, we'll keep it quick. No timer, okay. but I, 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 All right. let's so let's keep it quick. So, uh, so, so this fall is going to be different than previous falls, uh, or Latin than last, fall, right. sorry, than last fall, last fall, very little could happen. So what are you looking forward to doing this fall? That you so I don't want do to jinx fall? it, right? Cause there's this meme going around. I don't know if you've seen it, there's the picture of like my fall plans. And then on the right, it says Delta variant. I'm like, Ugh. I don't Sounds want to right. jinx it, but <laughs> I am looking forward to, um, getting back to at least two Northwestern football games, uh, this fall, go to those with my dad. I see friends. We do the tailgating. I'm looking forward to that. And then hopefully uh, come Thanksgiving week, we had a trip last year, a trip to France for my mother-in-law's a, a, a round number birthday. I won't say which, but um, that trip was, of course, postponed for the pandemic. Uh, we, we have some tickets. We, we are hoping that's going to happen again this year. So fingers crossed. Let's, let's hope um, COVID stays under control and some international travel can happen. Great. Yeah, so much. My- in a similar vein, um, I'm not a football fan, um, you know, quite frankly, uh, uh, soccer, but um, as probably every listener, listener yeah. ever will know. Um, but uh, but still, going to Lehigh football, uh, specifically tailgating, because tailgating is where I get to really yeah. hang out with friends, uh, with most of the time at least. Um, and so that tailgating with friends is, is, is really been fun. I've missed a lot of it from coaching soccer. And... Um, and so I may, you know, I may not even bother going into the game, even though we have season tickets for, for Lehigh football, but uh, being able to see friends and my, my daughter's a sophomore there. So, you know, she might swing by her tailgate, probably won't stay for long. <laughs> she doesn't want to, she doesn't want to hang out with mom and dad probably. 
no offense. Well, yeah, there's <laughs> plenty of options. Yeah, so, so, uh, so I'm looking forward to something very similar. So let's hope it works out. Um, yeah. Yes, sir. So we again want to thank everybody for listening. Um, you can find all of the past episodes. You can go to leanwhiskey.com. You can spell whiskey however you prefer with a K-E-Y or a K-Y. Um, those URLs will forward to my website, leanblog.org. Um, if you prefer, you can go to Jamie's website, which is... Which is jflinch.com slash lean. Um, so please do look for us on um, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, pretty much all of the main places you can find podcasts. Yeah, and please do rate us, review us, follow us. Uh, we really appreciate it. We appreciate the feedback and it helps other people find the podcast. And if you've well. listened this long, like there are metrics on the percent episode that people listen to and like we're not as long as like the joe rogan podcast i don't know how anyone listens to a three hour (laughs) long episode we're half that long but we realize it's a long episode hopefully as a a listener you enjoy hanging out with us um, whether you're having a drink with us or not and um, we appreciate you listening and or watching so next time will be episode 30 absolutely another milestone Look forward to it. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks, Jamie.